couple, but they are now few in the sense that uh, Simon and Christy Taylor are expecting their first child. Christy is pregnant, and so congratulations to them. It's so lovely to see you guys. Lovely to see you too, church family, and any visitors here. And um, we find ourselves on the first Lord's Day of 2021. 2020 was declared by pastor and politician alike to be a dumpster fire. But it wasn't. We know that. It wasn't. It was part of our wise, holy, and sovereign God's plan. And so too this year will be, regardless of what occurs. But if there's one thing that 2020 reminds us of and even reinforces is that for humanity, frailty is what we're marked by. Frailty. Even though we as humanity can be so driven and accomplish so many things, advancements in exploration, advancements in technology, sporting achievements, whatever it may be, when push comes to shove, Mankind is frail, feeble. The Bible has quite a lot to say about this. Job 14.1 says, How frail is humanity? How short is life? How full of trouble? Isaiah 2.22 says that mankind is simply a breath in the nostrils. Psalm 49 verse 12 says, Man in his pomp will not endure. He is like the beast that perish. 1 Peter 1 verse 24 says, All humanity is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls. Mankind is frail and fragile. Our frame is feeble. This is why the psalmist could pen in Psalm 103 verse 14, For he, that is God, himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. For the believer, the saved one, God is mindful that we are but dust. Weak, fragile, frail. So prone yet to think that we're strong, resilient, but the reality is that we're very, very frail. And an aspect to our frailty includes not only our physical bodies, but also our spiritual faculties as we journey through life. You know, our frailty means that we can be so prone to wander. So given to self-reliance, easily distracted, forgetful, at times blinded and effortlessly just going wayward, in and of ourselves is the immense propensity to slip and fall. To repeatedly sprain our spiritual ankles, as it were, unable to continue the journey with rigor and zeal. Do you ever feel like that? I hope I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone when I feel like that. (laughs) The journey toward Christ likeness is marked by one step forward, two steps back, so often. That in my spirit, I want to grow in personal holiness. And yet, time and time again in my flesh, I fail. And it can just feel like rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Stumble, trip, stumble, trip. Such is our frailty. In fact, so prone to wander... Are we that if it were not for God and his goodness toward us, we would in and of ourselves plummet headlong into sin and then sink away into it. But praise be to God. 
that that's not the ultimate outcome for the children of God. The believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we live out our pilgrimage toward our celestial home, no matter what we face, it's not our frailty that determines where we end up. But as we'll see this morning, in all our feelings of frailty, we are held firm by God. We truly do, as the Apostle Paul said, we have this treasure in earthly vessels, clay pots. We're held firm by God. You see, our psalm this morning, our second in our series this summer, Psalm 125, is one of the 15 psalms in the Psalter that are known as the Psalm of Ascents. And so I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 125, and let's read that together. Psalm 125, a song of ascents. Those little words, as you know, above the beginning of verse 1 are called the superscription. They are divinely inspired scripture, a song of ascents. Verse 1, those who trust in Yahweh are as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so Yahweh surrounds his people. From this time forth and forever. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest upon the land of the righteous, so that the righteous will not put forth their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Yahweh, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But as for those who turn aside to their crooked ways, Yahweh will lead them away with the doers of iniquity. Peace be upon Israel. Psalm 120 through to Psalm 134 are all titled Psalm of Ascents. Because they were sung by the Jewish pilgrims as they ascended up to Jerusalem to the temple area. And they did that three times a year. They did that three times a year for the special festivals of Passover, of Pentecost, and then the Feast of the Booths. The journey both to Jerusalem itself from a distance up the steep incline to the city was not easy. It was fraught with danger and trial. There were cunning thieves who would prey upon the pilgrims as they journeyed. Opportunistic thieves. There were wild animals to watch out for as they walked. There was incredible heat, dusty, dry conditions, pebbles and slippery surfaces, particularly up the steep incline towards the city. But as they walked, they sung this psalm. And it reminded the people, and it, must, and it must remind us today, as this new year begins, a year that will certainly be fraught itself with trial and danger as we traverse through it. The reality must be that it's not our feelings of frailty, nor our frailty itself, but our reality is that in God we are safe. Safe. Come what may, even though we are frail and given to timidity when come what may comes, and we trip over, we're safe. We are safe in Christ, who is our God. 2020 was a year from an earthly spec perspective as one of uncertainty. And uncertainty can breed, breed anxiety. You rarely get anxious about the things that you have full awareness and control over. You get anxiety over that which you don't have control over and that which you don't know about. Uncertainty. Unsettling events. The obvious breaking down of society. 
as God is shelved and immorality is redefined as morality, where evil is called good and good is called evil, as we see that happening even here in our own country more and more, that can lead to further unsettling and disquieting of our hearts and minds. This psalm that we will dwell upon today aids us immensely. As we set sail into the new year, it aids us immensely. It aids us by four moving parts. Each part of this psalm will highlight for us that even though we are flesh and bone, frail, mere dust, frail and weak, that is not all we are. That as we travel troubled paths and face unsettling events, we who have turned to trust in the one true and living God find in Him all the stability and all the security we need. To press on. And that's exactly what I want you to see in the first part of Psalm 125. If you're taking notes, I want you to see first, number one, we have stability from God. Verse one. Look there with me. Those who trust in Yahweh are as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. The psalmist, that may be David, but we don't know for certain, is here opening this verse, comparing believers, you and I, who are here this morning, to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is spoken of many times in the Psalms, many times. It's used in the general sense, referring to the actual city of Jerusalem, where David was king, and where David built up the walls around the city, making it quite formidable. It's also used in the prophetic sense, in places like Psalm 2, Isaiah 2, to refer to being the center of where the millennial kingdom will take place. And it's also used poetically. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, uses the phrase to speak of heaven, Mount Zion. And so there is this eternal abiding of Mount Zion spoken of in Scripture. And just as that is the case, so too is it the case for every believer. But what makes the believer immovable and eternally abiding? Is it his or her trust? Certainly trust, that is faith, is essential, necessary for saving faith. But is it the strength of one's trust or the strength of one's faith that ensures the eternal abiding? Look at the end of verse 1 which cannot be moved, but abides forever? No. The emphasis must be upon the object of a person's trust. For the strength of faith is not found in the trust or the faith itself, but the object of its trust. And verse 1 shows us that those who have Yahweh... The one true and living God, the ancient of days that we just sung about, as the object of their trust, they are then wedded to Him, the eternal Almighty One. And so yes, Mount Zion is great, and yet Mount Zion is merely illustrating that our eternal stability flows not from our trust, but from the object of of our trust, God Himself. And Charles Spurgeon in his Treasury of David exclaimed of this, what a privilege to be allowed to repose in God. And what is meant by the word repose is rest. What a privilege to be allowed to rest in God. So frail. So weak. So utterly enabled to endure and persevere, but because of a simple trust in a very strong God and Savior, 
What a privilege to be allowed to rest in God. And by His love and by His grace, He directed our hearts to not seek rest in a plethora of false gods. Never assume or think that you and I were just cleverer than our neighbors, our Mormon neighbors, our Jehovah's Witness neighbors, whatever it may be. Ne never assume that you were somehow smarter than they and you saw something. No, no, no. God, by His grace, gifted you. And therefore, hallelujah. He revealed to us the truth of who He is and drew us in and placed us into the privilege of rest in Him by a simple trust. I always want to be conveying to my children that there are not hoops to jump through in order to come to Jesus Christ. A person does not need to clean themselves up in order to make themselves prepared to receive Jesus. No, no. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in cleansing us comes after we have trusted. So my children, and your children, and anyone here, trust in Jesus. A simple trust in Jesus. In Jesus what? Jesus' life on your behalf. Fulfilling all the righteous requirements of the law that were required of you, but you could never fulfill. And trusting in His death, that you were guilty because you broke God's law, and that He hung upon that cross and atoned for your sins in your place, and then He rose again. Trust in that. A simple trust in the eternal Son whom Yahweh sent weds us to an almighty Father. You know, interestingly enough, the term Mount Zion itself speaks of the new covenant age. It speaks of the new covenant age. As I said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, it speaks of Mount Zion as heaven. The new Jerusalem. That's the hope of the new covenant believer. I want you to notice that verse 1 doesn't say Mount Sinai. It doesn't sound Mount Sinai. We could extrapolate a contrast here to that of Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. The psalmist here is not merely writing of the city as though... The bricks and rock are the mainstay and reason of our stability when he says Mount Zion. But he's also looking ahead to when the people will no longer find their security in the law, which was revealed at Mount Sinai, but they will find their hope and security in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as found in Mount Zion. And so Mount Zion illustrates to us that our eternal stability hinges not upon the law, but upon the one revealed in the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is not on the mountain of Zion that abides forever, but the Lord Jesus Christ and all those who trust in Him who abide forever. And so what kind of stability here is this talking about? In verse 1. Is it talking about physical stability? Is it talking about financial stability? Well, some charlatans would convince you it is. But no, for every believer is just as prone to ill health and hard times. Believers are not immune from ill health and hard times. And so what stability is this referring to? Well, quite obviously, it's referring to our spiritual stability. Because we are united to God by faith, not to the law of Sinai, but the gospel of Zion, we are eternally stable. So as frail and as prone to wander as we are, as discouraged as we can be at times, as downcast as we can get, as perplexed and as distraught as we can be, 
as hard as things may be and as challenging as things may get in our life, the psalmist wants us to see that stability never comes from ourselves. Never. Our stability comes from God who has given everyone who has trusted in Him eternal rest for the soul. It was Augustine who said, Our souls are restless until they find their rest in God. That's what we see first. Second, I want you to also see now that as believers, that is those who have trusted in the one true and living God and Jesus whom he sent. I want you to see second, number two, we receive our safety from God. Now in verse two, look at verse two. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so Yahweh surrounds his people. I just love that. The psalmist opened in verse 1 by comparing believers to Mount Zion. And here now in verse 2, he compares God himself to the mountains surrounding Jerusalem. There are seven mountain peaks. And Jerusalem, the holy city, sits atop of one of them. I'd love to go there one day. The six other mountain peaks encircling Jerusalem, act as a fortress, providing immense safety to the city. And in the same way, the psalmist is illustrating that God provides immense safety to his people. There are plenty of examples of the way God kept Israel physically safe. One of those is found in 2 Kings chapter 6. You don't have to turn there, you can read it later. But in the days of Elijah the prophet... There was an evil king fighting against Israel, King Aram, but God would continually thwart this evil king's plans using Elisha as his instrument to keep the people safe. Second Kings chapter six, the idea really in a nutshell is, was that the kingdom was under attack and in answering the prayers of Elisha, God afflicted the soldiers who were out to cause harm with blindness. And so that Elisha then, when they were blind, he then led them from where they were. He then led them into the city of Samaria, a capital of Israel, where then they then had their eyes opened. If their eyes were closed, you wouldn't be able to get them there. But their eyes were closed by God. And then they arrive inside Israel and the king, and the, the king and the armies of Israel were there to kill them. But then, when you read 2 Kings 6, the amazing thing is that that's not what happened. In God's wisdom, instead of killing them, God spoke through Elisha, sending the soldiers, after giving them a feed, a food, sent them back to their evil king, with word about how God was protecting and keeping Israel safe. So staggering was that, that the king Aram and his armies, it says in the final verse of Second King 6, they never came back into the land of Israel again. And there's a key phrase in that account in Second Kings chapter 6, made by Elisha. It's in verse 16 of 2 Kings 6. Let me read it for you. The context is, as Elijah's servant was feeling overwhelmed by the armies of the evil king circling the people of Israel, the servant cried out in anxiety, Elisha, what shall we do? And Elijah says to his servant here in verse 16, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. You see, as believers, we do have reasons to be overwhelmed. Many a reason, a rational reason to be concerned about even the days ahead. For who knows? To feel unsafe as believers, just as our brothers and sisters have in the past and do so right now in the persecuted world. 
As believers in Jesus, we certainly do have our enemies. There's genuine hostility from the world. That'll only increase as the days go on. But what we can be sure of is we do not need to be afraid because the army behind us and with us is far superior to the army of the world. Greater is he that is in me and all that he unites me to than he that is in the world. God does not guarantee our physical safety like he did Israel at times. We are not guaranteed physical safety. But what he does promise us here in verse 2 is that he surrounds us and actively protects us, protecting us from things that we cannot even see, guarding us from spiritual harm and slipping into more and more spiritual danger. Like those mountains that encircle Jerusalem, so too are God's Loving arms encircling us, keeping us safe from harm. Harm in the sense that we will never perish. And we will never be severed from His love. And His care. We're always bound up in His arms. Safe and secure no matter what we are experiencing. Our frailty doesn't determine who we are. The third part to this psalm, we see now after seeing that those who trust in God, we receive the stability from God and we receive safety from God, is also, number three, we are sanctified by God. I want you to see this now in verse three. We are sanctified by God. As I worked through this psalm, I was indebted to the Holman Old Testament commentary and the works of the outline of Phil Johnson, which I've been able to draw from. And Phil certainly outlined, highlighted this sanctification here in verse 3, which I thought was great. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest upon the land of the righteous, so that the righteous will not put forth their hands to do wrong. This is an interesting verse indeed. Even as the Jewish pilgrims would sing this psalm as they went up to Jerusalem for Passover and the like, they were not doing so in a type of utopia. I already made mention of the dangers of thieves and the like. That's one thing. But these Jewish pilgrims, they knew full well that the ones who wielded power were not always godly. To have a scepter in your hand was to possess power, to rule the nation. It was a rod held in the ruler's hand to signify possession of ruling power over that nation. The scepter of wickedness, it says there in verse 3, is to say evil rulers. The Jews at the time, as they walked and sung this song of ascents, including this psalm, it was a time when the Jews were in their land, but their land was ruled by godless rulers. That's the reality for believers throughout human history. It's certainly the reality for us in our day at present. Where Romans 1 is in full bloom. Where the political policy for government is literally Romans chapter 1. And as governments establish more and more policy that is counter-Christian and in opposition to the revealed truth of God as revealed in the Bible, what happens? The squeeze comes more and more. And that has a sanctifying effect upon the church. It has an individual sanctifying effect upon every single one of us as individual believers. Both as we are timid at what could occur 
and as we respond to what does occur. As the squeeze comes from ungodly rulers of our nation, we are more and more sanctified to respond well to blatant persecution. And we're sanctified to be bold and to show forth the worthiness of our God and Savior by being willing to suffer for Him. We've never been called to do that. But verse 3 is showing us that as the scepter of wickedness from ungodly rulers comes, it has a sanctifying effect. We weren't faced with it last year. We came close. But we weren't put in a position where we were going to willfully make the choice to rather obey God than man when it comes to assembling for worship. But God has always tested the hearts of His people and those who profess to be His people. And there's a sanctifying result when we are confronted with the scepter of wickedness. The church is purified in the refiner's fire of an oppressive and ungodly government. But, that, but what makes verse 3 so wonderful is a promise. There's a promise in there in verse 3. And it's this, that even though there will be ungodly rulers who legislate ungodly laws as they wield their scepter, their rule is not forever. God will deliver the righteous. Who, who are the righteous? Well, they're those who have been by God, according to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, clothed with garments of salvation and wrapped with a robe of righteousness. What's meant by the end of verse 3? So that. So that the righteous will not put forth their hands to do wrong. What, what, what is meant by that? It means that God in sanctifying us through ungodly rulers and government, knows that we can be, during that time, tempted to respond sinfully. And I would say that the doing wrong there at the end of verse 3 can include both reacting poorly and failing to react. What I mean by that is, we can be so tempted at the oppressive hand of ungodly government, which always has, as we saw in Psalm 2, the faith in its crosshairs, right? We can be so tempted to respond in the flesh by speaking ill of leaders. The Bible condemns that. You don't say nasty things about our Prime Minister. It's unacceptable. You critique things, but you don't say nasty things about governmental leaders. Or, on the other hand, we can be ruled by our flesh by being given to such timidity and fear. And just buckling that we, when we shrink back when we ought not. I really believe that an aspect of God's providence in all this virus drama is God sanctifying the hearts of those who are the church by the question, am I worthy? Oh, things are okay when, it's, when there's ease in Zion. But, but, but am I worthy? Am I worthy... Of your worship even when it is dangerous. You see. Worship has always been dangerous. 
Always. Just not in our times. And so God is at work in us. Verse 3 tells us. God is at work in us so that the righteous will not put forth their hands to do wrong. There is a sanctifying effect. We receive our sanctification by God in times of challenge. But it doesn't last. It doesn't last. It lifts off. For Israel, they saw this time and time again. And for us, we will see it. We're not promised a land, as it were, to possess, but a cross to bear, a Christ to proclaim, and a Savior who will return and make all things right. Well, the fourth and final part of this psalm is that, number four, we are guaranteed success by God. Guaranteed success by God. In verses four and five. Do good, O Yahweh, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. The psalmist now prays here for God to do good to those who are good. But we know from places like Psalm 53 verse 1 and Romans chapter 3 that there are none who do good. <laughs> there are none who are good. So what's this about? Well, the folks spoken of in verse 4 as being good and upright in heart, we must never forget that they're the same folk that are spoken of in verse 1 who trust in Yahweh. Trust. They have trusted in God for salvation. And when one trusts in Jesus Christ, they are then clothed with the righteousness of Christ that He accomplished in His living and His dying on their behalf. Now, here's a lesson for some, perhaps. The Old Testament saints, as they sung this psalm, they looked ahead to the Messiah, right? Trusting in His work on their behalf. Receiving His merited righteousness on their behalf. They looked ahead. We look back. Either way, the good are not good as a result of their good works. but the works of God in Christ Jesus on their behalf. And that's what is meant by we're guaranteed success. Not physical earthly success. But in line with the psalm as a whole, a spiritual success. Guaranteed eternal success. Based not on our own works, but the works of another. The Messiah. The Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yahweh will do good to all believers. Not as a result of the good that believers have done, but the good that Jesus did. Praise God. That is altogether opposite of the unbeliever. Verse 5. But as for those who turn aside to their crooked ways, Yahweh will lead them away with the doers of iniquity. Those who fail to trust in God for salvation, who reject the free offer of the gospel, who turn aside and turn away from it, God will lead them away and they'll be judged along with all those who reject the Lord. John chapter 3 verse 18 says, He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. To receive or reject the Lord is to find rest for your soul or a withholding of rest for your soul and only eternal judgment. And so as believers, we find in Psalm 125 some remarkable aspects of, to our spiritual security, right? We receive stability from God. We receive safety from God. 
We receive our sanctification from God. May not be a sanctification that sounds pleasant, but it's true. And we receive a guaranteed eternal success from God. And none of it comes from us. None of it. Praise God. Left to us, we would turn aside, turn away. But God. But God. And so in Psalm 125, we've walked through it. And it was Martin Lloyd-Jones who said that a Christian must be able to draw biblical theology and then systematize it in order to truly understand God. And so what we see as we journey now through Psalm 125 are all those remarkable truths pertaining to our spiritual stability, but we also see the doctrine of the persevering power of the triune God. We worship a triune God. Look at the phrase at the beginning of verse 1. Oh, so the end of verse 1. But abides forever. Look at the end of verse 2. From this time forth and forever. The persevering power of the eternal triune God. And what is meant by that is the eternal security and stability we have as believers is not found in us and what we do, but it is found in the persevering nature and character of the triune God. The Father's love and electing purpose in counsel with the Son before time began ensured the sending of the eternal Son into the world where He in His life and death merited for those whom the Father gave Him Righteousness and the forgiveness of sins through His living and through His dying and then being raised for our justification. Where then the Holy Spirit then seals us to the guarantee of our final inheritance, which will be ours for certain. For He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So frail. So fragile, so prone to wander, so given to timidity, bound to worry, facing hard times, anxious at uncertainty, but so loved and so held secure. That is the unchangeable reality. For the believer. If you don't yet know the Lord Jesus. Begin 2021 the right way. Trust in Jesus today. Let's pray. Father we come before you and say thank you for this time. The privilege is ours Lord to be allowed to rest in you. Thank you for. The reality of our eternal security. Thank you that you surround us as your people. From this time forth and forever. Thank you Lord that even though ungodly rulers. Reign for a moment they shall not rest. Upon the land. But they're here just for a time with a sanctifying effect upon us. So that we won't put forth our hands to do wrong. Wrong by being too bashful and zealous and wrong by being too timid. Thank you, Lord, that you do good to those who you've made righteous. Not by anything of ourselves, but through faith in the Son of God. We pray for anyone here who is rejecting the free offer of the gospel, turning aside to their own crooked ways, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would save them and be merciful to them. And like this psalm ends, peace be upon Israel. Another way of saying amen. And so we say amen and ask that you would watch over us this year.
We pray for the church family that are all away traveling. Keep them safe. May they praise you as they enjoy the creation. May you take all that's transpired here this morning and help us to set sail with this beautiful psalm in our mind that we're held firm and we're safely surrounded. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.